But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here's the question. Is the rapture imminent or are we waiting for a Jewish temple to be built? So it's a question in two parts. Now, I'm going to quick fire a few verses from the Bible to you. I'll give you the references so you can go in and look at the context for yourself. I'm not going to make a big thing about the rapture in this video. This video is much more about the temple. So just quickly, Matthew 25. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So we're told to watch, not for the temple, but for Jesus Christ, or for the hour of his coming. Romans chapter 8, verses 19. 23. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Philippians 4 verse 5 Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Jude 1 verse 21 Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. These verses are all talking about waiting in the expectation he's coming. James chapter 5 verse 8 Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Revelation 1, verse 3 Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Bear in mind, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 talk about the church here on earth. Luke chapter 12 verse 40 This is Jesus speaking 
Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 4 through 6 But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So there's a few verses and a few more besides of the imminency the imminency of the coming of Christ to take us, to catch us up. And we know that this can't be about the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns with all his saints. For a start off, he returns with all his saints. But also we know there's a time frame, there's a seven year period of two and uh, two three and a half year periods which scripture clearly defines so these verses are surely talking about the rapture being before the seven year tribulation period because if you believe that we're waiting for a temple to be built in Jerusalem by the Jewish people, then you, you can't believe the rapture is imminent. And this is the division between pre-tribulation rapture and mid or post-tribulation rapture. So let's talk about the temple. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. So chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 in particular. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So what's the context of these scriptures? Well, the context is the two epistles to the Thessalonians. So Paul is writing in Greek to Greek-speaking people in a Greek-speaking country. Thessalonica or Thessalonica that you'd think and by the way there's the Jews aren't mentioned in these epistles there's a, a very brief reference there's a passing reference to the Jews um, that has nothing to do with 
the temple or, or these related issues. Okay, so you'd think that if this, if Paul was telling the church something important about a temple being built in Jerusalem by Jewish people, then you'd think he'd write the epistle or include this information in an epistle to the church in Jerusalem, which was mainly Jewish Christians. But Paul never mentions this in any reference to Jewish people or in Jerusalem. Another thing is that if this temple is, as scripture says, a temple of God, then that can't be built in Israel under Netanyahu. Okay, let me take you to the scripture. Okay, we're going to read a little bit of scripture about the first temple now. In First Chronicles chapter 28, we'll start at the top of the chapter so you get the context. But um, just the first three verses, okay. And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, and captains over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons, with the officers and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God, and have made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and has shed blood. Okay, so David wanted to build the temple, but he wasn't permitted to by God. So what David did is he did everything in preparation for the temple. And then when Solomon, his son, was made king, everything was ready to go for Solomon to start the building of the temple. Solomon had never been to war. Now let's have a quick look at Netanyahu. Okay, so look. Netanyahu joined the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, shortly after the Six-Day War in 1967 and became a team leader, right, notice this, a team leader, in the Syret Matkal Special Forces Unit. Now, that's pretty high up. Yeah, that's a sp Special Forces they go on specific missions, okay? And Netanyahu was a team leader in the Special Forces Unit. Netanyahu took part in many missions, including Operation Inferno, 1968, Operation Gift, 1968, and Operation Isotope, 1972, during which he was shot in the shoulder. Netanyahu fought on the front lines in the War of Attrition and the Yom Kippur War in 1973, taking part in special forces raids along the Suez Canal, then leading a commando unit, uh, sorry, a commando assault deep into Syrian territory. Netanyahu achieved the rank of captain before being discharged. Okay. Well, obviously, Wikipedia isn't going to say, you know, whether Netanyahu killed anybody or shed blood. This should be pretty clear to people that Netanyahu, just like King David, was a man of war. 
Now, obviously, he was in a what looks like a six year period, maybe a five or six year period. He was a team leader. He was in special forces. He was in three major operations. He fought on the front lines in two wars and he led commando assaults deep into Syri Syrian territory. Would it be fair to assume that Netanyahu has shed blood? Um, well, he worked his way up to rank of captain, so look, you don't get promoted in the army unless you're good at soldiering, which means in times of war, you kill. Okay, so I'm not saying this for any condemnation of Netanyahu at all. You know, King David, exactly the same, a man of war. I've got no problem with that. But according to scripture, let's read verse 3 again. David speaking says, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. So if this, an imminent rapture, or a Jewish temple, if this is an either or, the odds seem to be stacking up towards an imminent rapture. And I believe that the scripture does say rapture is imminent, which means it can be today. It can be, it can be in the next hour. Because Jesus says, thou knows not the day nor the hour. The rapture can happen before I even finish recording this uh, video. But of course, obviously, if you're listening to it, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but I mean, it hasn't happened yet as I'm recording it. So what we're going to do is we're going to really look at this temple of God in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. That's what this video is about. It's about the temple more than the rapture. Okay, I want to show why pre-tribulation rapture and anything else, whether it's mid-tribulation or post-tribulation or post-tribulation pre-raf or whatever words people want to call it, I want to show you why those doctrines are not compatible. And I'm going to be accused of dividing the brethren of this, that and the other. It doesn't matter. There's a reason that these two doctrines have been so far apart, so different, so at odds with each other over the years, the centuries, etc. Because, because we can't be in agreement with a false doctrine or a, a different gospel. And I'll show you that that's what this post-tribulation uh, rapture doctrine is. So Ephesians chapter 2. Now, if you ask anybody what Ephesians chapter 2 is about, most people will remember these verses, maybe even including verse 10. But not a lot of people re remember or know what the chapter's about in its fullness. So let's just back up to check verse 1. Let's go from verse 1 through the first seven verses that lead into Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. 
and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus okay this is all leading into the gospel message here for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God have all before ordained that we should walk in them okay let's just read on a little bit more wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Okay, and so on and so forth. I don't want to cut the gospel short there, but I want to get to some points here, okay? So first of all, verse 8 is talking about being saved. By grace are ye saved. It's talking about salvation. So when we talk about salvation, we generally mean or infer or assume that we're talking about our eternal spiritual salvation. Okay. But now, is this verse talking about your eternal spiritual salvation or physical salvation or both and most people will say your spiritual eternal salvation but I'm going to show you scripture now that shows you that you cannot separate your spiritual eternal salvation from the physical salvation from the wrath from the tribulation, from the horrors to come, etc. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Okay, towards the end of Luke chapter 1, we have Zacharias, who's a Levite priest, he's the father of John the Baptist, and he makes prophecy. Okay. His father, talking about John the Baptist, his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying. So what we need to understand is what follows here, pretty much down to the end of the chapter, is prophecy. It's not Zacharias' opinion. It's not his worries. It's not his fears. It's not his state of mind. This is prophecy by God by the Holy, through the Holy Spirit and he's prophesying the coming of Jesus Christ so he prophesied saying blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people and have raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, 
that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life and thou child should be called the prophet of the highest this is talking back uh, he's ref referring back now to John the Baptist and thou child John the Baptist shall be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God whereby the day spring from on high have visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace okay that's the end of Zechariah's prophecy there and then the last verse talking about John the Baptist says and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel so when we look on this prophecy by Zacharias we're hearing a language that's very reminiscent of the Psalms of David and much of the Old Testament scripture okay we see this we see this kind of language over and over again in the Psalms being saved from our enemies from the hand of all those that hate us this sounds just like King David to me in the Psalms being delivered out of the hand of our enemies all the days of our life the knowledge of salvation etc so this salvation that Zacharias is prophesying is both a physical salvation and a spiritual salvation the eternal salvation okay to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins okay so salvation by forgiveness of our sins and you could say that Zacharias John the Baptist father here is the last prophet to prophesy of Christ coming before he's born I mean you, it could be argued the wise men from the East etc kind of prophesied it but um, pretty sure that when that star the star of Bethlehem came to show them the place of Jesus birth that they weren't prophesying the birth of Christ yeah no look now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem okay there came wise men from the East so the wise men were not prophesying the birth exactly they followed a sign okay so they were following prophecy rather than giving prophecy so going back to Ephesians now so Paul is talking to the saints who were dead in trespass and sins but are now uh, raised up in Christ he's talking to living people this scripture is talking to us okay it's talking to living people it's talking about salvation which for us because we believe in the imminency of rapture we can talk about this salvation 
in Ephesians 2 as being both uh, eternal spiritual salvation and physical salvation. Now, let's go down to the end of this chapter. So we're going to look at these last four verses here, which talk about temple. Okay, and I want you to pay attention to all the words and phrases in these four verses that speak about buildings or being built or the verb to build okay so from verse 19 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and all the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit So what we see in these four verses are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine references to building or buildings or building materials at the end of Ephesians chapter 2. We're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God were built upon the foundation, the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom, in Jesus Christ, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth, that's pretty important, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's look at what else Paul has to say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let's go to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Bought with a price. You are God's, God's children, belong to him. So your, temp te your body is the temple, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the temple of God. Go to chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 10 is the only time Paul mentions a temple when he's not talking about the temple of God. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm showing you every verse where Paul speaks about or even mentions the word temple. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, this is not a temple of God. 
Okay, for if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? It's the only time Paul mentions a temple which is not the temple of God. Let's continue, chapter 9, First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. They which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple. Even so have the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, not of the gospel, as the prosperity preachers like to add a little F to this word. They which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. We're in Second Corinthians chapter 6. Okay, we'll take it from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So, back to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be, all be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ, not the day of the Lord, the day of Christ is at hand, The day of Christ is referring to the rapture. The day of the Lord is referring to the second coming, as in Revelation 19, when Jesus returns with all his saints. That's all of us. Okay. So the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, two different days. The day of Christ is when we get caught up to Christ. The day of the Lord is when we come back with Christ on huge massive white horses <laughs> okay um, and the armies uh, of Satan the armies of the nations of the world make war against us so here's the thing here's the thing okay let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God. Now, this is important. Showing himself that he is God. Okay. This isn't saying that the Antichrist is God. Okay. Let me just clarify this. So that he, as God, it means to be like God. He's showing himself to be like God. Okay. Sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. 
Okay. It doesn't mean that he is God. It means he's showing himself to be God, as God, like God. He's going to appear to be God pretty much to anybody, to anybody and everybody. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, every time Paul talks about the temple of God, he's talking about the body of Christ. Let's just go to John chapter 2. We'll hear it straight from Jesus. Okay, this is Jesus talking to the Jewish people here. In fact, this is just after Jesus chases out people from the temple, the actual physical temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so Jesus chases out merchandisers, people selling things selling um, animals for sacrifices etc at the temple then answered the Jews and said unto him what sign showest thou unto us seeing that thou doest these things Jesus answered and said unto them destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Okay, so the three days are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, on the first day he died on the cross and was buried before the sun went down. Okay. Uh, and then on the third day is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he spake of the temple of his body. So does this mean his physical body? Yes, he was physically raised from the dead, resurrected from the dead. But it's also talking about us. We are the body. We are the body of Christ. Which is why Paul goes to such lengths to define the temple for us as being the body of Christ. With the resurrection of Jesus Christ comes the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. They come out of the ground, they're resurrected as well. And then begins the building of the temple, okay? In three days, I will raise it up, the temple. Destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. He's talking about his physical body. And as Paul explains, the temple of God being the body of Christ, the church. Paul reiterated numerous times in Scripture. So the Antichrist... Is revealed, son of perdition, that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Let's go back to Ephesians. So verse 6, talking about God. God have raised us up together and made us sit together. Sit together. This is why I highlighted This little phrase here. Okay. Sit together in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Okay. And then Paul makes sure in this chapter. We know. That we are the temple. So the Antichrist is revealed. In. Sitting just like we are made to sit together. As Paul tells us in Ephesians. The Antichrist is revealed sitting in the temple, in the body of Christ. So the Antichrist will be a professing Christian. Now I've had my words recently twisted, saying that I'm saying the Antichrist is a Christian. I'm not saying that. I've never said that. 
I'm saying, I'm just telling you what scripture says here. The Antichrist will be revealed in our circles as a professing Christian. He has to be. He's the Antichrist, okay? He's not the anti-rabbi, the anti-imam, the anti-Buddhist priest or anything else. He's the Antichrist. He's the Antichrist. So he's revealed he's in the body of Christ right now, right now. Okay, the son of perdition, Jesus said, of Judas Iscariot, he was the son of perdition. Okay, Jesus speaking in John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, talking about the disciples, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. This is Jesus praying to the Father. I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now look, the son of perdition. Exactly as it says in Second Thessalonians, the son of perdition. So there's only one son of perdition, the Antichrist. Okay, here Jesus is talking about um, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was revealed as the betrayer or as the son of perdition in the body of Christ, in the discipleship. The Antichrist is, is always in the body of Christ. He's the antibody. He's the antibody in the body, okay? If that makes sense. The Antichrist, Judas Iscariot, spent three years or more in the body of Christ, in that, in those twelve, in the twelve disciples that were with Christ, that, that professed Christ, professing Christians, if you like. I know we don't really refer to the disciples as Christians as such um, before, before the cross and before the resurrection. But you understand what I'm saying, yeah? Judas Iscariot was professing Christ. He was with the twelve, with the twelve, one of the twelve. And Jesus calls him the son of perdition. So the Antichrist, look, nobody knows the day or the hour but the Father. Nobody knows the day or the hour but the Father. Okay, not even the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Son of Perdition is revealed in the body of Christ. Then we're out of here. The, the Antichrist can then tell the world whatever he wants to tell the world. If he's Jewish, if he's part Jewish, if he's Gentile, whatever. Because I'm not saying he's a Gentile. I'm not saying he's a Christian. I'm saying he's a professing Christian in amongst us right now. He's been, God's been building his temple since the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Since the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has been building his church, the body of Christ, the holy temple. It's God's been constructing this temple and only the Father knows when that last soul will be saved. Okay, when that, when that temple's complete, we're ready to go. We're ready to be raptured out of here. And at that moment, when that, when the temple is finally complete, is finally built, it's not a third temple of stone being spoken of here. It's the temple of God. The temple of God. It's in plain black and white here. And I've highlighted black and yellow, if you like. 
I've highlighted it, but it's the temple of God. It's not a temple made by unbelievers. Or even a temple made by believers. It's not a stone temple. Even, even King David was not permitted to build a temple. Okay, he had to pass that duty on to Solomon. So there's all the son of perdition is always, always in the temple of God until he's revealed. He's always in the body of Christ. He's been in the body of Christ for two thousand years. Then when God's ready, when the Father's ready, when the last soul that will come to God before the tribulation period because there are tribulation saints but they're not the temple they're not the um, they're not the bride okay they're not the bride of Christ when the last when the last soul comes to Christ to complete the building of the temple of God then the Antichrist is revealed but he's he's a professing Christian. He's he could be anyone that professes Christ, just like Judas Iscariot was a professing follower of Christ until he was revealed as the anti. So here's the problem with mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture: is that under every post-tribble or mid tribber you'll find works with all these prophecies of red heifers and buildings of stone temples you'll find works and Ephesians 2 9 tells us salvation is not of works lest any man should boast it doesn't say any saved man any Christian man, any Jewish man, any Gentile man. Scripture says any man. Not of works lest any man should boast. And the problem is that you'll have people preaching this as the gospel, which it is, and then go on and say, that non-believers have to build a temple before we can be saved which is heresy which is another gospel and it's those same people that tell us we shouldn't be divided on this but in order for them to claim that non-believers are going to build a temple they're going to have to add a lot of stuff to scripture We'll go into the Old Testament scripture now. So to begin with, the only two references to a temple in the book of Daniel are here in Daniel chapter 5, talking about the temple in Jerusalem, in verses 2 and in verse 3, the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And these verses in this passage, there's nothing at all to do with the Antichrist or the prophecy of the coming of the Antichrist or any such thing like that. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9. So where does this idea come from that a temple is going to be built for the Antichrist to be revealed in. Well, it's this word sanctuary in Daniel 9, in verse, verses 26 and 27. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. Even unto the consummation 
and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, now look. It's prophecy. So they point to these verses and say, there you are. The sanctuary, the sacrifices being ceased, the abominations, the desolation, etc., etc. The thing is that although there's many scriptures where the sanctuary does indeed refer to the temple, it's not the only meaning. There are many meanings for sanctuary in scripture. The sanctuary also referred to the tabernacle before the temple was built. It also refers to a few other things. Let's have a look. In Psalm 102 verse 19. For he have looked down from the height of his sanctuary. It's talking about God. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. So here in Psalms we have the sanctuary as a word being used for God's sanctuary, heaven. Heaven is God's sanctuary. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offence to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So again, I refer you back to Judas Iscariot. The son of perdition was revealed as the betrayer in the sanctuary, in the body of Christ or in Christ. He, he professed Christ and the other eleven were saved. People, the bread, they were brethren brothers in Christ. So the son of perdition in the gospel accounts was revealed in the sanctuary. What we need to know is if there's any scripture that talks about the actual stone temple in the end times. Okay, so let's go to Amos. Now I do believe that there are indications in the prophets for sure that there will be a temple in the time of Jacob's trouble and I'm pretty sure that's what we're seeing in Amos chapter 8 here the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day saith the Lord God there shall be many dead bodies in every place they shall cast them forth with silence. I'm pretty sure that in this scripture and in other scriptures, there is going to be a future temple in Jerusalem. But we need to understand that if Israel wanted to build a temple, it could build a temple today. Israel has power, wealth, land. There's absolutely no reason at all why Israel can't build a temple and can't build a temple in Jerusalem even. But Israel doesn't want to build a temple anywhere. It wants to build a temple on the Temple Mount. So some certain things would have to happen for that even to be possible because there's a dome on the Temple Mount. It's a it's an Islamic mosque, if you like, for want of a better word. Um, it's not exactly a mosque, but it's some kind of Islamic controlled um, place of worship. So two things would need to happen for a temple to be built on the Temple Mount. First of all, 
that dome, that Islamic mosque or whatever you want to call it, has to be taken out, taken down, dismantled, demolished, whatever you want to say. And the second thing is that there would have to be some agreement between those that control the site of the temple uh, mound and those that want to build on there. So the tribulation period consists of two periods, two, three and a half year periods. The first period is where the Antichrist makes a peace accord with the whole world. If a temple could be built in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, it would be during that time, in the first period of the tribulation. And then halfway through the tribulation period, the peace accord, accord is broken and then we go into three and a half years of the time of Jacob's trouble which is what I believe this is talking about here in Amos chapter 8. Uh, the end has come upon my people of Israel. The songs of the temple should be howlings in that day. There should be many dead bodies, etc. So all that's quite possible. I mean, I don't know. We don't know. It seems that that's what the scripture would be indicating that all these things are in the time of tribulation and not before. Now we're just going to look really quickly at these sacrifices, okay, which people are saying there has to be a red heifer, it has to be an unblemished um, male cow or whatever. Uh, these animal sacrifices that are going to happen. So a temple has to be built for these sacrifices to happen. Well, scripture shows us other things. Scripture shows us that there are more than one meaning to prophecies. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, you're going to see that there has been human sacrifices at the temple. The altar is in front of the temple doors. It's pretty much in the same place. Okay, it's just outside the front of the temple. Okay, so we have blood, the blood of saints. Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. What we need to understand about the, the prophets Many, many of the prophets, maybe all of them, I'm not sure, but many of the prophets were priests and Levites, and they were put to death by false priests. If you remember in the story of Jezebel and Elijah, Jezebel had the prophets of God slaughtered, and then there arose the prophets of Baal, etc. False priests, the priests of Baal, prophets of Baal. Prophets and priests, I'm not saying the words are interchangeable, but often the prophets were priests. Okay, The prophets of God are the real priests of God. And the false prophets are the false priests. Now, the prophets... The prophets, pretty much all the prophets were um, taken out, killed, murdered. But scripture is telling us there's human sacrifices at the temple, okay? And these human sacrifices, I mean, this is just giving one example here, okay? But I believe there's many more than that. The sacrifices in the book of Revelation, the human sacrifices, the beheading of the tribulation saints, 
if the Antichrist does raise a stone temple in Jerusalem, he is going to do it by satanic human sacrifice. At the end of the three and a half, at the end of the first part of the tribulation, that's it. No more will be saved. There's only tribulation saints in the first part of the three and a half year, or the first three and a half year period of tribulation. Then the peace accord is broken. Okay, so scripture says that the Antichrist will cause the sacrifices to cease. So I'm not saying that the sacrifices in the Old Testament prophecies are human sacrifices. I'm not saying they are animal sacrifices. I'm just saying that people who are saying it's definitely one this thing or the other thing are not reading, they're not aware of the whole of the scripture. You need to be aware of the scripture before you start preaching that we're not going to get saved until the temple is built and the sacrifices stop and all the rest of it. Because these things are, these things run very deep. Very, very deep. And I am going to touch more on these subjects in future videos. Um, particularly in the new year, I'm going to continue uh, a series that I started, which is about John the Baptist. That's going to run deep into these areas, okay, because John the Baptist absolutely was started to, he was the first one that really started calling out what's going on here. And then Jesus obviously continued. Jesus was the one that, Jesus was the one that John paved the way for. So everything that John says is paving the way for Jesus to um, explain to us. So when John calls out generation of serpents who warned ye to flee from the wrath to come, Jesus reiterates that in conversations with the Pharisees later in scripture. Okay, so John the Baptist was saying some really, really important things concerning these kind of subjects. And we're going to go into much deeper study in the new year concerning these things in this series that we'll be looking at John the Baptist and then going more into what Jesus actually said. Okay, and how John led us into Jesus. John cleared that way for Jesus to come. Um, but those are for future videos. So, so saying that, I'm going to leave it there for now. I don't believe that a temple is going to be built before the rapture. I believe that if it's going to be built and it's going to be built on the Temple Mount, that has to come in that first three and a half year period of tribulation and it will probably happen very quickly it doesn't mean they're not preparing for it now it doesn't mean Israel isn't preparing for it it doesn't mean these things aren't underway but for the Antichrist to be revealed does not require the building of the temple or not a stone temple it requires the completion of God's temple the body of Christ and it doesn't require the breeding of heifers or um, anything like that at all the completion of the body of Christ the revealing of the Antichrist these things are not reliant on anything else at all this is all in the Father's hands only the Father knows the time uh, the day and the hour okay so so I'm going to leave that there and wish you all God's blessing may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all Amen